Hey decoders and welcome back. This is Science Decoded, where we break down recent results in science with the researchers themselves so we can get accurate, simple answers. Recently, researchers out of France published evidence of when in evolution cells might have developed the ability to move which, as you can imagine, is a pretty big step for cells in biology. It's always hard to date things and get really specific, especially when we're talking about paleobiology. So this is something difficult with paleobiology to measure. And so this was a really big uh, leap that cells made. And so if you want to know more about it and, and what they're proposing, definitely go to our website and check it out. Also recently, NASA reported the discovery of graphene from meteorites, which typically has never been found outside of Earth before. And it even took a really long time for graphene itself to be found. So this is pretty cool that, that this carbon-based mineral graphene, just solely carbon, Um, was found formed outside Earth. If you head to our website, cyworthy.com, you can read about how these studies were done and why their research was important enough to get published and funded. Today on Tips and Tricks, we're going to be talking about the introduction of a paper. So after reading the abstract of the paper, my next big question I always ask myself is, why does this matter? Scientists attempt to answer this question during the introduction of the paper, and more specifically within the first paragraph. Typically, introductions start with a broad overview of the topic, and some simple facts that help catch readers up on information that they need to know. Some of these facts come with citations from other papers, so you can go and check out the abstract of those papers if you're questioning how a group of scientists have interpreted previous work. After alerting the readers to the important information, scientists will go on to describe this problem that they're attempting to solve. Some writers are much more clear about answering this question than others. I always look out for what I call negative sentences, in which the writer tries to describe something wrong with where science is at right now, or something wrong with other people's understanding or conception. They can be important indicators to a scientist's justification of their research and its place in greater knowledge. So today we're going to be breaking down the effects of psychedelics, more specifically psilocybin, and how they impact creativity in the human brain. Psychedelics were first synthesized in the 1950s and 60s in attempts to make medicine that could just improve cognitive diseases like depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia. Much of this research stopped after the drugs were criminalized in the 1970s. When the research was stopped, scientists and doctors were left with a lot of questions, as much of the research done up until that point had focused only on clinical applications of these drugs, for example, just the treatment of diseases. Since that time, our understanding of these diseases have drastically improved, and many more have become officially diagnosable. Recently, there has been a renaissance in psychedelic research, mainly taking off in Europe. Scientists around the globe are beginning to investigate these drugs again, this time at different dosages and in a wider variety of applications, such as cognition, creativity, and for PTSD therapy. The study we're covering today was conducted by Dr. Natasha Mason from the University of Maastricht, and she chose to focus her attention on how psychedelics affect what we know about creativity. Creativity is a hard thing to define, and an even harder thing to measure. However, scientifically, we've been able to break it down into two important categories, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking, for example, is using a bowl of soup to drink your coffee out of because you ran out of mugs in the morning. And convergent thinking is when you come up with the most creative and most useful solution for an object, kind of like the best solution. However, the definition of and how to measure creativity is still widely up for debate, so keep that in mind as we continue talking. There is plenty of anecdotal evidence or story-based evidence for psychedelic drug enhancement of creativity. You would be hard-pressed to find an artist or musician who didn't use LSD or magic mushrooms in the 60s and 80s. But even more so, some important scientific discoveries during that time arose from this enhanced creativity gained from the use of psychedelic drugs. What might be the connection between tripping and creativity? In a study done by Harmon in 1966, published by the Institute of Psychedelic Research, they listed 11 important self-reported psychedelic effects that may have helped increase creativity in the drug user. Some of those effects are reduced inhibition and anxiety, increased visual imagery and fantasy, as well as increased empathy with people, and an approved association between ideas that aren't similar. Now, again, these are self-reported effects that were commonly shared among participants in this study, and there was no biological evidence to support these claims. And that's where Natasha's research comes in. The goal of these studies is to provide biological data about the brain during active creative thinking, so that we might debunk, explain, or empower a lot of these unofficial reported side effects of psychedelics. 
When we get back, Natasha is going to tell us about the scientific evidence in the brain that she discovered and is going to help us describe what exactly is going on with your creative centers, both on and off drugs. So stick around. Welcome back, Science Decoders. Uh, it's me, your host, Justin, and I'm here with uh, Natasha Mason. She's a PhD student at the University of Maastricht in the Department of Neuropsychology and Psychopharmacology. And she recently published a paper titled Spontaneous and Deliberate Creative Cognition During and After Psilocybin Exposure. So, Natasha, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, for our listeners, can you describe your job and your primary responsibilities in your field for any listeners who might be interested in what you do for a living? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah, I think my my affiliation and my department title kind of gives away my background. So, I, I previously studied psychology and, and neuropsychology and also pharmacy and have my PhD now in psychopharmacology, so studying the effects of, of drugs on the brain. Um, and what I do, like my specific focus is researching the effects of cannabis and psychedelic, how they affect the brain and how they also affect uh, affect, so emotion, uh, behavior, and certain aspects of cognition. So, within this focus, I even I have a, a stronger interest uh, in in the and how psychedelics work, and particularly in how they may work in a way that is therapeutic or beneficial for those who are taking them. These drugs are being kind of reevaluated for their therapeutic potential in treating disorders like depression and anxiety. So a lot of this work happened in, in the 60s, where uh, they were investigating this and saw promise, uh, but then these drugs were banned starting in the United States and then throughout the world. Uh, but now psychiatry has come to kind of a standstill in regards to effective medications for these very common disorders. So they're revisiting psychedelics like psilocybin, which is found in magic mushrooms, and LSD, which is, I think, very commonly known, <laughs> uh, to, to treat people. Uh, and they're finding very promising results. The clinical trials are, are currently quite small, but... They're actually in treatment-resistant populations, so people who have not been treated by anything else. Uh, and they're finding that after one or two times of being given the psychedelic, people have very rapid and sustained decreases in symptoms. So there's a lot of buzz, a lot of hope that these substances can kind of fill this gap in psychiatry. So in regards to what I, I do every day, so I, I use various yeah research designs and methodologies to to try to answer these questions. So this includes experimental studies where we actually bring people into the lab, we give them the drug in a controlled environment, uh, also a placebo so we can really assess what's what's due to the drug. So this is very uh, standard uh, design in psychopharmacology research. And here we can employ our kind of fancy methodologies like brain imaging, assess cognition via various tasks uh, and, and try to understand what's going on when people take this. Uh, but we, we also employ other types of studies as well. So naturalistic observational studies. This means going into the real world <laughs> where people are taking <laughs> these drugs and asking them to fill out questionnaires and perform tasks before and after. Uh, and then other work, survey studies, so we can talk to a, an international large sample of individuals about their drug experiences so we can gain some some insights. So we use all of these study designs and all of these methodologies to try to answer our questions. Well, that sounds like a lot of work, but I think you get a lot of information back from that that kind of helps you make this informed decision making. Um, also, you recently uh, defended for your PhD, correct? So congrats on that. That's a really big deal. 
reading the title of your study, you know, spontaneous and deliberate creative cognition, a few things, a few words stick out to me, you know, like creative, creativity, um, obviously psilocybin, those are kind of the, the two variables that you're looking at here. What specifically was the question you were trying to answer? To give you a bit of backstory, so one of the longest standing claims in regards to effects of these substances is that people report that when they are under the influence, they have enhanced creative thoughts. And also in the long term, they have enhanced creativity. So after they use it, this this increase is sustained. Uh, And there are a lot of reports from users who, who use psilocybin, magic mushrooms, or LSD and other related psychedelics. And there are also some very famous examples of psychedelic affiliated creative breakthroughs. Carrie Mullis, who I think you would be more familiar with, the, the discoverer of the PCR uh, uh, reaction. So he he attributed his discovery to an LSD experience, or maybe multiple LSD experiences. Right? There are authors and musicians, so Aldous Huxley, Ken Casey, American author, or musicians like Jimi Hendrix, even... Uh, Steve Jobs from Apple, who attributes their their insights and their ideas and and influence from psychedelic drugs. So there's a lot of kind of hype and reports that these drugs do enhance creativity, but this had not been studied systematically. So there were previous studies, again, before the drugs were banned, in which they tried to, to assess this, but methodologically, these studies were questionable, fine for the time, but they mm-hmm. wouldn't stand up to, to today's kind of standards. And we had also, in our naturalistic work, uh, what I said before, this is where we go to where people are taking the drug and ask them to fill out creativity measures, in this case, before and after. We see that after a psychedelic experience, they have enhanced creativity. So that goes mm. to the question, okay, acutely, when individuals are under the drug, is this the case? Does this stand up in a controlled, placebo-controlled like design, right? A more rigorous study design. Mm-hmm. And if it does, are there also long-term enhancements and what's going on in the brain in order to allow for these processes to take place? So with this, we wanted, I mean, we basically have the first placebo-controlled study assessing whether psychedelics enhance creativity or not. Absolutely. And, you know, the idea of creativity is also kind of a broad topic. And I would say it's a very difficult thing to measure. Mm-hmm. So how did you define creativity in your study? And what makes you satisfied by your own definition? Yeah, that's also a great question. And that's a very <laughs> difficult and, and subjective question. because Creativity means different things to different people. Uh, in the more scientific, maybe creative literature, uh, it's oftentimes defined in more of a problem solving sense. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a, a functional outcome. And that makes sense, right? Because you, you, you use creativity to think outside of the box, typically to apply something new to solve a problem or to fix a situation, or potentially you hear creativity used in finding solutions a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's how that's how we approach it. And that's uh, but I don't think that's the general opinion. Uh, an example of this, um, it, when I present these results, usually I start off with a slide where I show the participants in the audience pictures of famous people that are generally thought to be creative. So I have Jimi Hendrix, Aldous Huxley, Steve Jobs. Uh, and I say, OK, raise your hand if you think this person is creative. And of course, all the hands go up for all of these people. Uh, and then I have a picture uh that represents themselves to say, okay, do you think you're creative? And then, yeah, some hands stay up, but a lot of them go down. Mm. Um, And I continue this with another, it's like a a poster picture that says uh, create or die, which sounds very extreme. (laughs) But I I try to make the case that that it's it's not really, yeah, it's not as much of an overstatement as, as you would think. And that's in this problem solving approach, creativity allows us to adapt to this ever changing environment and come up with ways to solve problems. And in that definition, humans as a species are creative. We as individuals are creative. This allows us to be successful in our daily lives, Mm -hmm. whether it be like an extreme example of when we'd started using tools, right, to be more effective or a more modern example of yeah, trying to get home when your car is broken down. I mean, this is you have to think creatively in order to solve that problem. And I think the car example can be a good example for how we define it, because then within creativity, you have two constructs that are taking place. You have divergent 
and convergent thinking. Mm. So if you're thinking that your car is broken down, you have to figure out how to get home. You kind of have to brainstorm. Divergent thinking is really this idea generation. How can I solve this problem? So do I jump on the bus? Do I take the train? My friend lives around the corner. Do I go ask if I can get a ride? And then convergent thinking is where you're thinking, trying to come up with like the most efficient solution, right? So then you think, okay, the bus is super slow. The train is expensive, but my friend is there and then I can see him and then it's actually fun and he can take me home. So we look at creativity, at least this more deliberate creativity as these two constructs. Um, I think as you pointed out in the title as well, we also have this other aspect of spontaneous creativity. Mm -hmm. So that is not goal directed. That is more unfiltered, random thoughts. Um, I think for spontaneous creativity is very akin to like the, the dreamlike state, right? Where you have these very weird things going on, these connections that are being made, but you're not directly controlling it. Mm -hmm. So this is also another, another type of creativity that we also look at. Well, I think it's awesome that you were able to monitor both deliberate creativity, you know, that kind of functional assessment and then the the spontaneity type of it. You know, I think a lot of times yeah. that's more associated with art yeah. or people who are, you know, again, um, product development or kind of thinking outside of the box or building things and, and kind of making something out of nothing versus, you know, problem solve, solving. And I think that kind of speaks to both sides of the coin of creativity. Mm -hmm you know, in order to compare brain states and compare uh, a brain on psilocybin to a brain on placebo, you guys focused on three resting brain states. Um, can you talk to, can you talk about how you studied those and their relevance to your study specifically? So a network is basically a, a bunch of brain regions that work together, but then you have to take a step back and say, what is a brain region? So our bra a brain region is our attempts to kind of break the brain down into areas that um, perform the same function or have the same cellular processes, et cetera, right? And these consist of however many million neurons um, that we think are doing mm -hmm. the same thing. So this network is a set of brain functions that seem to work together for a specific function. Uh, and it's yeah, been established through various studies that there mm -hmm. are kind of reliable that we have reliable brain networks. So we see these uh, when uh, we're doing more resting state fMRI, so when, when you are not doing a task. Um, and one of the most popular, let's say, brain networks now that, that is in a lot of, it's of interest to people is the default mode network. Um, so this, in general, we find it's engaged during more internal processes. So this includes uh, self-reflection, uh, reliving autobiographical memories, um, daydreaming. So anything that that relies on memories of kind of our past experience. Overall, it does seem to be involved mm -hmm. actually in almost everything, but that's because it's very connected. But in general, this is its proposed function. And in regards to creativity, it's suggested to support idea generation. So this is the divergent thinking aspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, the executive network or the frontal parietal network, the, they're called different things, is engaged when we are problem solving. Problem solving, uh, uh, performing tasks, etc. And in regards to creativity, this is thought to encompass the more convergent aspects. So idea evaluation, right? You came up with all of these ways to get home and now you decide which is the best one, which mm -hmm. one should I use. And then the third one is the salience network. And the thing about the default one network and the executive network is when one is active or more active, the other is not active. So one is on, the other is off. They're anti-correlated. Mm -hmm. So the salience network really facilitates the shift between the like internal default one network and the external executive network. So it's shifting from idea generation to idea or to idea evaluation mm -hmm. that is not based on our work right this is uh, previous million studies. other studies that have been done yeah. but this is also what we find in our research mm -hmm. right so even under psilocybin we find that the default mode network uh, is related to individuals divergent thinking performance executive network is related to their convergent thinking performance those networks are what you're measuring in the resting brain states correct exactly okay awesome so, uh, you know, reading a paper like this, I kind of have to ask this question, I feel like, but you guys used a dosage of uh, 0.17 milligrams per kilogram of psilocybin. 
how does that compare to recreational doses that are reported um, throughout the world that are being used? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. That's probably the number one question. I guess. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can say very vaguely, it's like a moderate dose of, of psilocybin. So, of course, uh, when you use uh, the substance at, at home, usually you, you're not using synthetic psilocybin. That's what that's what we use. Mm-hmm. But usually, individuals ingest psilocybin via mushrooms or in the netherlands we actually have psychedelic truffles which grow underground Mm. Uh, and the content of psilocybin in each of these mushrooms or truffles obviously differs according to the strain and it differs per mushroom so it's very hard to say but in general it would be a moderate dose yeah and the reason for the question too is um, one thing with this psychedelic renaissance, I think that's happening is previously in some of the work, you notice very large amounts of LSD and psilocybin being studied. Whereas I think one thing in biochemistry is you can have a drug that gives one effect at one mm-hmm. concentration, but then becomes therapeutic at a lesser concentration, right? So as we begin to find the more highly defined or the highly specific interactions of these drugs with our body, we might be able to be finding some of these therapeutic effects as compared to recreational use, which gives you kind of the euphoric and like mental effects as well. Yeah. I mean, if you would compare it to our dose to the the therapeutic doses that are being done in clinical trials, we give about 12 milligrams. They give about 20 to 25. It's about half that. Okay. So about uh, and half that. we picked this for various reasons. Uh, one of them is during the, acute states they're actually in the fMRI so when they're when they're experiencing the peak psychedelic effects they're in our fMRI machine yeah we wanted everybody to be feel comfortable <laughs> in, in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah but also we are looking at various tasks we want to see if, if psilocybin increases creativity if you are on 20 or 25 milligrams of psilocybin you don't even have a body so you cannot fill out uh, our tasks or answer questions. So it's more of a state that's representative of the psychedelic state. People are clearly intoxicated mm-hmm. they're under the influence, but it's not full blown where we cannot communicate with them. Yeah. And I think that's also something you have to take in, into account with experimental designs and, and neuropharmacology such as this. You used two different creativity tasks. Can you describe the two different tasks and what variables each one was measuring? For our creativity tasks, so now that we're talking about this deliberate kind of goal-directed creativity, right, that we they had a problem that we were asking them to solve. And here we used a task called the alternative uses test and the picture concept test. So the alternative uses test is kind of the gold standard in creativity research. It's also one of the oldest tests, I think. Uh, And it's very simple. We give them an item, uh, a brick, a pencil, a bottle, and we ask them, how many uses can you come up with for this item? And then what we do is we go through and we score how many uses they came up with. So this is fluency. This is just the number of responses. We ask, uh, then we also assess how original they are. So this is comparing the uniqueness Mm. of their response to all the other people in the study. In the alternative use test, do we see people, I don't know, taking a bottle and saying, oh, I could make this into a rocket or something like that. And that being considered like a redeemable or appropriate answer to the test, like are there limitations put on the creativity or can anyone really just say anything with somewhat logic? It doesn't have to be logical. Um, I have seen so many uses for what you can do with a bottle that I would not recommend. (laughs) Um, It's a good point to elaborate on. So just because it is unique does not mean it's necessarily useful so we we also did and this is not in the standard rating uh, usually you don't take that in in consideration also because i understand i mean it is subjective what is creative to you is not creative to me like who am i to say that your response your response doesn't make sense but it really is an important aspect that i think is overlooked in a lot of creativity things Uh, also the cultural aspect of their responses I had one individual who, I think he was the only person to put it, he said throw, or, yeah, hit hit somebody with a shoe because it is a huge sign of disrespect or something. Not necessarily that it's crazy uh, unique, but nobody else put it, right? So in mm-hmm. that regard, it is original. 
But then when I asked them about it, I said, yeah, but this is a cultural thing. I come from India, I think. And there, like, it's, it's, it's practiced. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so th- these aspects are not taken into consideration when just assessing for fluency, originality, and, and the ratio, right? Can you explain the picture concept task a little bit? So this is the gold standard, but this only assesses divergent thinking. This is only how many, mm-hmm. like, coming up with ideas. It's not evaluating whether they're a good idea or not. That's why we also wanted to use the picture concept test because this also looks at convergent thinking. So in this, people are shown, let's say, four pictures and they have to come up with associations between the pictures. Uh, And there are correct responses. So first we ask, what is the most logical response? Uh, And a theme throughout the stimuli are animals. So Mm. if they're shown a cup, a dog, a cat, and crayons, then the correct answer that the logical association is a dog and a cat. So then we, okay, that we just sum that. That's the, the outcome variable for that. How, how many correct responses did they get? That the, that's their measure of convergent thinking. But then you can also take that task a bit further and you can say, okay, now come up with as many alternative associations, as many creative associations. So then mm-hmm. they could combine dog and crayons and then we ask them okay why did you make that association well maybe one time their dog ate their crayons or something and this is what they write down and then we can also assess this for fluency how many alternative responses originality which is how unique they are and the ratio now would the originality have to depend also again like on cultural context or previous experience my dog's never eaten my crayons but (laughs) if that happens for someone else then you know i think that would be a really natural neural connection to make yeah yeah exactly and it it yeah, um, it, it definitely is dependent on these factors, but in that regard, we don't control for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say one more aspect we looked on in regards to the alternative uses test, and this is actually something that we found a long-term increase in after psilocybin, is when we actually asked people, okay, have you ever thought of this connection before? So that mm-hmm. means that would rule out the cultural aspects, maybe that would rule out the whether your dog chewed your crayons or not and it's really like okay i've never seen this in a movie i've never considered it i've never seen somebody else do it it's completely new and that's Mm -hmm. what we see seven days later an increase in after psilocybin is this novelty aspect so again one of my favorite things too about your study um are all the pictures that you guys got to take and the brain imaging data you collected Mm -hmm. and you guys used a functional uh, mri experiment in which an MRI is used to image the activity of the brain using the blood flow as an indicator for the increased activity. Did you need to change the conditions of your experiment from a conventional fMRI? Um, And if you did, how'd that affect your experiment? In regards to the methodological procedure, how the, what the machine is running and and kind of the the sequences we're using, nothing changes there. It was very standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, sequences and and whatnot. So I don't think it exactly answers your question, but there were aspects that we changed because we're dealing with individuals who are tripping. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for some reason, our fMRI comes equipped with like rave lights, like very, (laughs) like really (laughs) nicely colored lights in the room that that change. (laughs) So you go from blue to green to red and, and all of this. So we actually... We, we always put those on uh, just to make it seem a little less clinical and, and a little bit more. I mean, everybody who was at least on psilocybin said, and also placebo, said, you know, this looks like a spaceship. Yeah, and they, they seemed to be like a much more eager to get in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also changed the amount of time it took us that we, we gave ourselves to get them in the scanner, right? Again, this is a science paper, so something like that isn't necessarily <laughs> reported in the literature, you know? No, um, no, no. But I wish it was. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, I mean, it's also the, the fun part of science. I mean, you're working with these participants who are lovely uh, mm-hmm. and are having their own experience. So to put these anecdotes in would, would be very nice, but also helpful for other people wanting to run a trial with these substances, right? You don't know mm-hmm. off the bat. I mean, the first time we put somebody in the scanner under a psychedelic, I was really nervous because I didn't know, are they going to stay in? Are they going to have a, a bad time? You know, what, what do I do with this? How can I make mm-hmm. them more comfortable with them? <clears throat> now, obviously, all of this methodology and all of these materials eventually built up to the results that you guys came to in your paper. And so the paper states that there was an increase in glutamate concentration, which is a neurotransmitter, 
um, increase in reported feelings of insightfulness, increase in novelty and follow-up scores, but you reported a decrease in both convergent and divergent thinking when on psilocybin. So what do these results indicate? Well, they indicate that the effect of psychedelics on creativity is really complicated. Very multi-leveled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, we, we touched on the difference in, in constructs on creativity. So this task-based versus spontaneous. So we see that in regards to deliberate task-based creativity, they, they show decrements mm. uh, or decreases when they're under the influence, whereas they, but they report increases. They, they report feeling more creative, the spontaneous. So I, I didn't explain how we measured that, but this is basically a questionnaire where we asked them when they had sobered up to reflect on the drug experience. So when they were um, high and just rates. Um, so questions like I had creative thoughts. Uh, I gained insight into problems that had been bothering me. Uh, new connections. I made new connections, things like this. And they report that this did happen. So we potentially see this differential effect between task-based creativity and spontaneous creativity. Mm. Um, you could also argue that maybe they just feel more creative and they're not actually more creative. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very valid <laughs> argument to make. Uh, we, yeah, further research needs to look into this uh, and, mm -hmm. and try to differentiate that. So let's go back to talking about some of the images on the brain. What did you guys see as far as the network connectivity when a participant was on psilocybin? Yeah, to revisit again, a network is a set of brain regions which tend to work together uh, for a function, right? There are two characteristics of this, right? The network, these brain regions work together, but by working together, that also means that they are segregated from other brain regions so that they don't work with other brain regions. And we call this within network connectivity when they're working together and between network connectivity. So that's usually anti-correlated. When one is active, the other is not. Uh, and we see that under a psychedelic, there's a decrease in within network connectivity. So these brain regions that usually talk to each other are not talking to each other as much or something mm -hmm. is dysregulated. And it could also just be one brain region that isn't talking as much and that kind of disintegrates the network a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but we do see that actually in this disintegration, this decrease in how much these brain regions within a network talk to each other, they talk more to other brain regions that they don't usually speak to. So that's mm -hmm. increase between network connectivity. Yeah, and there are some some very detailed theories on, on why and how, and I think that's kind of out of the scope of, of this conversation. But in some, we're seeing that psychedelics disorganize, usually very... Um, yeah, I don't know, highly organized brain function. Wow. Well, that's still pretty incredible. I mean, I really feel like that also provides some evidence alluding to this idea that we're increasing connectivity between regions of our brain that aren't normally and mm -hmm. that could potentially increase some form of creativity or um, insight, you know, when you get two parts of your brain to work together that, that normally don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're making connections into different thought patterns or what have you that, that you would no longer make. I mean, on, on a theoretical sense it, it really makes sense uh, but it's 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 trying to to study that and trying to quantify that and accurately measure that which is more difficult oh for sure well i just have one more question for you okay and i'd like to ask this of all my guests that come on the podcast you didn't actually get it in the the interview sheet ahead of time but can you tell us today you know why you came on the podcast and is there anything that you'd like to tell our listeners out there who are curious, skeptical, or even frequently confused about science and um, literature and what's going on in our world? I mean, I came on the podcast, of course, to, to talk about this work, uh, as we also had in a previous discussion. I mean, you, as a scientist, you're trying to answer these questions, right? Uh, you, you're curious about something, you want to understand how something works. Uh, so you, you try to figure out, uh, yeah, try to answer this. Uh, but you're not trying to keep that answer to yourself, <laughs> right? So that's, a, that's quite a selfish perspective. You want to share this with other people. Uh, that also makes the work worth it as well when other people can hear about your results. That's also how you, you can build a bigger picture uh, around these very difficult concepts to study, like creativity or like, I don't know, the, the ultimate questions like consciousness. Like we all want to add 
little uh, pieces to the puzzle uh, to try to understand, in this case, you know, the brain, right? And, and we want to communicate these results to, to anybody who, who is interested in them. Uh, and of course, a really, I think, big issue in bridging the academic literature to the general publication is, uh, but we're not explaining it in terms that, that people can understand. And I don't mean that in a looking down on people way, but it, we're not, we are not able to explain these in terms for the general public or population. That's why mm-hmm. it's nice that you send some questions about what we talk about, because it really takes me a lot of effort to be able to explain this simply. Um, and I think there's a quote somewhere saying that you actually don't know a topic <laughs> unless you can explain it simply, right? So it's also good mm-hmm. for me to understand what I'm doing by reformulating it and trying to communicate it to to another person who's who's not in the very specific field of psychedelics and creativity. It can feel like you're speaking another language. Mm. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of translation, but mm-hmm. I feel like ultimately, you know, everyone can understand science as yeah, long as yeah, you communicate it correctly, you know. It's our role as scientists as part of our job to communicate it correctly. Yeah. Right. If somebody doesn't understand it, then that's not a problem with them. That's our fault. We did not explain it simply enough. Uh, so any effort taken in order to do that, I think, is, is extremely important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, anybody who's willing to listen, also that's that an open uh, to, to this, this realm. That's also very important and appreciated. Mm-hmm. Well, Natasha, thank you for taking the time uh, to come onto the podcast and talk about your, um, your work. Uh, congrats again on defending newly minted Dr. Mason. Um, like I said, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, thoughts, or want to look into the effect of psychedelics and drug on the brain, um, definitely, you know, Google neuropharmacology. Uh, there's a ton of research coming out of Europe right now. That's where you are, Natasha, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So as the United States laws towards research and and drug research uh, is beginning to change. I think a lot of other countries already have fast-tracked a lot of this. So if you guys are curious, you may have to go outside of the United States for research on this. However, there is definitely research being done and questions being answered elsewhere. Um, Also, check out our site at cyworthy.com. We've got plenty of articles on stuff like this, um, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks again. Hi, Gina here. Thanks for listening to Science Decoded. We want to thank our host with the most, Justin Dingman, as well as our behind-the-scenes team members, Osama Alien and Garrett Campion. Our channel artwork was designed by Tammy Whitsons, and our theme song was written and recorded by Graham Albright. We'd also like to thank our Patreon and local supporters. Without all of you, we couldn't do what we do. SciWorthy is an initiative of the 501c3 nonprofit Blue Marble Space. You can learn more at www.bluemarblespace.org.